Hey everyone, welcome back to Tutor Terrific. In this video, I'm going to do a calculator tutorial, and that calculator is the Texas Instruments TI-84 Plus, the original version which ran on AAA batteries. The um, basic design for the interface of this calculator is equation operating system, and so you're going to work with expressions, you're going to plug those expressions in, and then you're going to press enter to evaluate them. Now that contrasts with the algebraic operating system, which you do one algebraic operation at a time and then see how the result is affected by that operation. Sometimes it feels like you're doing certain things in reverse. For example, plugging in the input to a trig function like sine and then pressing sine to evaluate it. The sine of that input, um, there's other things with uh, squaring numbers and such where it feels the same way in algebraic systems. But the equation operating system is good for um, more advanced calculations where you want to see the whole thing before you evaluate it so you can check it for errors and I'll go over editing and inserting things in a little later. So turning the calculator on, of course the on button in the bottom corner like all Texas Instruments systems and that cursor shows up. If you want to turn the calculator off you can simply just leave it idle and after a few minutes it will automatically shut off or you can press the second button, okay? You know the second button's pressed when that arrow is in the cursor. And if you press the second button, what you'll activate is the action of any of the blue uh, text above each button. So if I press the on button right now, it will activate the off and it will turn the calculator off. So that's your basic on and off. Let's go over some basic operations. Make sure that our um, of operations is working correctly. Um, for example, simple algebraic operations input, here they are over here, divide, multiply, minus plus. Let's do 7 times 5 minus 3. So if it does this in the correct order by multiplying before subtracting, you should get 32. And if it does it in the wrong order, where it does the subtraction first, you would expect to get 14. So let's press enter like this and we get 32, like we expect. Now, if you'd like, you can do more calculations on this same window, since it's so large, without having to erase anything. So let's try another one. 9 plus 5 divided by 6. Press Enter, and you can see that calculation on the same screen. Now, if you want to get rid of all these operations, you can, of course, press Clear, and all of that goes away and the window's blank again. If you'd like to recall, for example, an old entry, you can do that as well by first pressing the second button and then pressing entry. It'll retrieve your last entry you had and you can evaluate it again. But you can go back farther into the memory recesses of this calculator by pressing second entry a second time. You'll go back to the previous calculation before that and before that, and before that, and you can do this as much as you'd like until you get to the beginning of the calculator's memory. Now you can, of course, clear your memory, um, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. So, that's your basic operations, but uh, there's many more we can do that are basic, like squaring something. For example, um, 6 squared, that's a very popular one, so it's up here in the front, and we can, of course, uh, evaluate that the same way by pressing enter. Um, we can do a square root as well. We would press the square root button first and then let's do 64 for example. You can leave the parentheses open but uh, it's good practice to close it in case you have more complicated calculations. And there you go, you press that and you get 8. So there's some basic operations for you. Now, I've shown you the second button but I also want to show you the alpha button. The alpha button is very useful as you can see all, this will activate all of the green text. Now most of these are just letters of the alphabet. Now how this is actually useful is for storing values. Uh, maybe this could come in handy later on for you. Let's just say 44.8 is a number you need. Well you can actually store that as a letter so you don't have to type those four buttons. You can just press a particular letter. Um, the store a value, you press the store button down here, okay, which gives you that arrow, and then you need to click the letter you want to store it as. And so you would press alpha, and you can see when alpha's 
pressed, you have an A in the middle of the cursor. That lets you know you're in alpha. Let's say I wanted to store that as the letter A. Okay, so I click that. Now you see after you do alpha one time or the second button one time, it will revert back to normal button pressing and you don't see any of those special symbols anymore in the cursor. So if I press enter now, it just gives me back the number, but it is stored as A as well. So if I call A in an expression, it will um, be equal to 44.8. So check this out. Let's say I just wanted to type the letter A and then press enter. It gives me its value, 44.8. Let's say I wanted to use A in an expression. One plus alpha A minus six. Okay, you should expect to get 39.8 if you do this. Boom, right there. So it's using A as 44.8. And that is perfectly fine. Now A will be stored as 44.8 until you reset it to be something else. So just keep that in mind. And you have many, many letters, 26 of them to pick from to store lots of different things. So just understand that when it's really nice. Okay, so those are some basic features. Now, what if you have a really complicated calculation and you made a mistake? You're like, oh no, I don't want to type the whole thing again. Some people just press clear and just clear the whole thing out and start over. You do not have to do that. So let's say I'm like doing some really complicated thing with finances and I've got uh, lots of things I'm adding together, multiple products. For example, like this. Okay. And I make a mistake. Oh, darn it. I wanted to put 0.9 versus 0.8 because it's gonna calculate it wrong. Well, don't just press clear, hold on, let me show you. You can go backwards with these, uh, with the pad buttons. You can go up, down, left or right. You can go to your mistake. Let's say you wanted that to be 0 0.9 instead of 0 0.8. You can put the cursor right on that eight and press nine and now it's a nine. So you didn't have to redo the whole thing. You didn't have to retype it in. You could just go there and press 0 0.9. What if it wasn't 0 0.9 but it was 0 0.95? Oh no, what do you do? Well, there's something you can do, and that's the insert button. Above the delete button, which we'll go over in a second, you can see INS. If I press second, delete, now you see the cursor is not a bit black box, but a little line. So what that's gonna do, and a little underscore actually, what that's gonna do is allow you to put something in front of what's blinking. So if I type five, it inserts that character in its place allowing you to evaluate it now. And you can do that insert as many times as you want. So I press second delete and I type a bunch of numbers. You see it's putting all of those numbers in after the first one, okay? Now let's say, oh shoot, I have uh, something I don't want. I need to get rid of it before I calculate it. Let's say you want a 0.2 instead of 0.25. Well, you could just press DEL, the delete button and it will delete that character. One other basic operation I'd like to show you guys is how you can use your previous answer. It's really, really helpful. So this calculation again, seven times five minus three equals 32. I can use that previous answer of 32 multiple different ways. If I just press an operation, so just divide, what it's gonna do is it's gonna load my previous answer and say, what would you like to divide it by? And it will, that previous answer is always stored as ANS. Well, I'll divide it by four and I should get eight, which I do. But there's more to it than that. I could plug a previous answer in anywhere in another expression. So for example, seven times five minus, now let's say I want to take that answer. I know it's easy to type in eight, but just for the sake of the exercise, let's get the previous answer loaded now. What I do is I press second, and down here, by the way, there's two minus signs here. This is the minus, and this is the negative button down here in parentheses. You can see ANS is above that. So if I press second minus sign, now I've loaded my previous answer to my last calculation. And by the way, this is only the very last calculation you've done. So now it's 27, seven times five minus eight is 27. Now 27 is ANS. So that's a useful tool for doing complicated calculations. You want to do parts at a time. You can load the previous answer into your next expression. 
Okay, now what I want to show you guys that's really important is called the mode window. It's kind of your settings window for your calculator. There's a couple that are really important. For example, um, look at everything is uh, notated in sort of row format. So each setting is a row of this mode window. Um, normal scientific and engineering is the type of calculations you're doing and how they're viewed. Um, the next one down is kind of important. It's uh, the number of decimal places that are going to default on the calculator for numbers that might have an infinite repeating decimal or non-repeating irrational decimal. Um, you could decide how many decimal places after the, the decimal you would want to default to. You can go up to 9 or you can do floating point which will uh, just truncate it where it needs to be, um, if it's a finite decimal or not. So uh, that's one important setting. Another really, really, really important setting is the third one down, radian versus degree. Now these are two different um, units for angles. And um, if you want to be in radian mode, all the angles you plug into any of the trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, etc., will be treated as in radians versus if you clicked over here you pressed uh, you press the right arrow to highlight degree and press enter now it switches the setting to degree mode so now the angles you plug in will be treated as in degrees there's no symbol written you just have to know what mode you're in so by the way i didn't say say this but everything that is um, selected right now as the setting is highlighted in black so if I move off the degree, you can see the degree is now selected versus radian mode. If I press enter again on radian, it'll switch back to that. To get out of the mode, uh, sorry, yeah, mode window, I'm going to teach you a new button called quit. If you press second mode, it will quit whatever you're doing and take you back to the main page. Now, since we're talking about trig functions, let's do a few of those to make sure you understand where they are in the calculator and how to get them. Remember, right now we're in radian mode. And this will give me an opportunity to show you where pi is. As we know, pre-cal or algebra 2, the unit circle, um, fractions of pi are very useful angles in radians. So all the trig functions that you can see right here are a sine, cosine, and tangent. They have their own buttons. So let's just type one in. We're going to type the trig function first, unlike algebraic operating systems calculators. And then we're going to plug in, let's say, pi over 2. Well, where's pi? Pi is above the caret button, which I'll get into a little later. You can see it there in blue, right above it, next to the h. So I need to press second, caret, and then I have my pi. And then I can type divided by 2 to get the over 2. And we should get 1 for this if we're in radian mode. Correct. Good. Now let's say I was accidentally in degree mode when I did that. So I'll switch over to degree mode. Quit to get out of that window. And I will recall the previous entry. Now I'm in degree mode. I get a very different answer. And this is an infinite decimal going as far as possible because I'm in floating point mode. And notice that um, I'm looking at pi over 2 degrees, so 1.57 degrees. That's what the sign of that is. So you've got to make sure you're in the correct mode. Now if I did the sine of 90, which is equal to pi over 2 radians, it's reading it in degrees, and so I should get 1. Perfect. So that's what I'd expect. So things are the same for cosine and tangent. Now, how do you get the reciprocal trig functions, secant, cosecant, and cotangent? Well, there's no special button for them. What you have to do in this calculator is literally press, well, you have one or two ways to do it. Um, I'm going to do it the fraction way. Cosecant will be the reciprocal of sine, or in other words, 1 over sine. So if I plug in um, 90, because I'm in degree mode, this will be the cosecant of 90, which is equal to 1 over sine of 90 which would also be 1. Same is true for secant, you would do 1 over cosine, and cotangent, you would compute 1 over tangent. So there's another way to do it, though, if you prefer exponents, and that would be to use the negative 1 power. So if I wanted the cosecant of 90, I could do the following. I could write sine of 90 inside a set of parentheses, and then I could do this, which may be good for you, um, the negative 1 button, 
So this is like the negative one power, which would be cosecant of 90. So you could do it that way as well. But you'll notice, and you might have already noticed, that above the sine, cosine, and tangent, there are sine negative one, cosine negative one, and tangent negative one buttons. Those are not reciprocal trig functions, guys. Those are the inverse trig functions, okay? So we're in degree mode. We would expect the inverse sine of one to give us 90 degrees. So I'm gonna press second sign. I'm going to plug in one because that's my value at 90 degrees, and I should get 90 out. Perfect. So now you know that those second buttons are for the reciprocal trig functions. Now if you wanted to do an uh, inverse cosecant, you would have to do one over inverse sine. But those don't come up much, so I don't anticipate you needing those. So just so you know, those are the trig and inverse trig functions and how they are used. Let's go over now um, some other types of functions, power functions or log functions, okay? So to get any power, um, note, it, note that there's a special shortcut, not only for the squared and the negative one powers, but also for the third power. It's commonly used. So let's say I wanted to find nine to the third power. Well, there's a special tool for that. You go to the math menu and as you can see in this first one, we have um, the third choice as three. Okay, that's the cubic power. And so we get 729 for that. Notice also right underneath that in the math window, there is a special button for the cube root and for the xth root. Okay, the cube root, of course, we know what that does. Um, if I press four right now and then type in 27, I would expect to get three when I plug that in. Perfect. Well, if what do you want a higher order root? Well, you would click math and then you click the five, but before you click the five and you go to this menu, you need to click what power, you type in what power you wanna use, what degree of your root rather. So let's say I wanted to find the fifth root of 32. So I'd type five and then I'd go back to the math menu, click number five now it's going to do is it's going to see that as the fifth root. It's taking that five to be the value of x. Notice how there's no parenthesis here. I've never understood that, but it's not like one's really needed, but I always do it just to be extra safe. And you get a two for that. But what if you wanted a higher power, not a higher fractional power and a radical, but a higher power? Well, I've shown you this before, but it's the care button. So um, what I do, let's say I want five to the fifth power. I would press five and then I press the caret button and then I press five again. So this will evaluate five to the fifth power, 3,125. So you can get any power that way. Now, what about log functions? There's a couple log logarithm function buttons here on the side. And I want you to know that this calculator cannot find the log to any base. It, it defaults to uh, log base 10, that's the L-O-G button, and log base E, which is the, of course, natural log button. So if I type log and I type in 100, it's gonna evaluate the power that you need to raise 10 to to turn it into 100, which would, of course, be two. So this is log base 10, the common log. Of course, we could do a natural log as well. And just so you know, there is a button for E, and that button is second divide. You see that E up there? Press second and then the division button, and you can get the number E. And um, if I evaluate the ln of E, I should get a one. Perfect. So what if you did need to find the log of a different base than 10 or E? Well, you can do it using this workaround formula called the change of base formula. So let's say you want to calculate log base three of 27, which we know is three. So um, you can't use base three, so you'll have to change it to base 10. So what you'll do is you will click, or you could change it to the base LN, but we'll do uh, base 10 just for simplicity. You would type the log of the argument you're trying to find, which is 27, and you'll divide that by the log base 10 of the old base. 
This will evaluate the log base 3 of 27. So that's the workaround, and it also works for ln this exact same way. You can use the change of base formula to change any log of a certain base to a log of any other base. ln of 3, and you would get 3 as well. So that's the workaround for finding the log of a different base on this calculator. Now I want to move on to the last topic of this video, which will be graphing features. So this is a graphic calculator. We want to know that it can graph. Well, that's totally true, and that's why it has a mostly square screen. To plug in a formula you want to graph, you're going to click this Y equals button here. And that gives you all these different options for graphs. You can graph up to many, many, many um, graphs at the same time. If you scroll down, it keeps going all the way to 10. You can have 10 different graphs at one time and three different plots, which we'll get into in another video with statistics. So let's say you wanted to graph a nice curve. Let's do um, x cubed minus 4x squared plus 1. How do you get that x that's a variable? It's this button here. Okay. Now I've shown you where um, the cube is, math 3. I like it because it's nice and simple. Don't have to use a caret for the cube button. Minus 4x squared, so minus 4x again squared uh, plus 1. Okay, so it's there. Now how do I see it on a graph, on a Cartesian coordinate plane? I click this graph button on the opposite side of the calculator. Now what this shows me is a 10 by 10, well really 20 by 20 grid, 10 tick marks on each side of the origin and the x-axis, same on the y-axis. However, you can see that they're not evenly spaced. The y-axis is, is a little bit squished to get the same number of tick marks. So they're not evenly spaced in both axes, they're not on the same scale. But it's close enough and you can see the tick marks as the dots. Let's say you wanted to zoom in or change the window. I'm going to show you to change the window first so you can see uh, maybe a different set of tick marks. So right now, what this window shows is that the minimum x tick mark, the leftmost tick mark is negative 10, the rightmost tick mark, x max, is positive 10, and the change in tick mark is 1. Well, I can change all of that. Let's say I wanted to just go from negative 5 to 5. I would have to delete the 0, by the way. And um, on the y-axis, I want to go from negative 7 to 7. Now, I know this will be even farther out of scale, but just to give you an idea, you will click Graph. So you can see now that it's only going from negative 5 to 5 on the x-axis and negative 7 to positive 7 on the y-axis. Now, let's say you wanted to undo those changes quickly. Well, here's what you could do. The zoom button allows you to zoom in and out or zoom to any particular setting default. And that would be for us to get back to where things were, zoom 6. Now, as soon as you click that, it will graph it at that new zoom. If you click on window, you'll see that it has reset my window. Let's say I wanted to change how the X tick mark increments, not by ones, but by twos. So I should see half as many tick marks, and that's exactly what I do. Each tick mark represents two units on the X axis instead of one. I can also do that on the Y, similarly by changing Y S C. Now let's change it to four, so we should see very few tick marks the y-axis, so each y tick mark is now four apart from any other one around it. And again, pressing zoom, six will reset all of those settings back to the original. Now I can analyze my graphs many ways with the calculate feature, which is second trace. But I also want to show you trace real quick. If you click trace, you can follow along on your curve and look at the x and y value at very particular spots. Now it's very pixelated, so most of these spots have no meaning, but you can get a general idea of how the x value and the y value is changing as you go from left to right. But let's say you wanted to calculate particular spots, particular locations, such as calculating the minimums and maximums of the graph. Well, this time you'll click second trace, and you get this window of things you can calculate. Number one thing I want to show you is how to calculate a minimum and a maximum. So you go down to three, 
you click three, now you're looking at your graph and it's asking you left bound or right bound. So what that means is, since we're calculating a minimum right now, I go back just to double check, it's a minimum we're calculating. We want to get on the left side of that visually understood minimum, which is right here, anywhere on the left of it, and press enter. And then it says right bound, so you want to move your cursor so that you're on the right side of that minimum. And you can see these two arrows. It's going to calculate the minimum value between those two spots. And it says guess. And it's not really a guess. It's actually calculating it. Press enter again. And then the minimum y value is there. And where it occurs is the x value. The same can be done for a maximum if you press second trace. And then you click 4. Now we're looking for a maximum. We know where it is. It's right there on the y-axis. So we want to get on the left side of it. Press enter. Then right bound. Get to the right side of it. Press enter. And then press enter again. And it finds that particular maximum y-value of 1. And um, then where it occurs. Now this particular, let me show you, 1.4. It looks like it's right at 0. 1.45 e negative 6. That's exponent, meaning scientific notation specifically, so that means times 10 to the negative 6. So this is basically 0. It should be exactly 0, but the way the algorithm is done in the calculator, you can get that a little off. That's just a small error. So another important thing, if you press clear, this will all go away. All this analysis would be to calculate maybe your x-intercepts. Those would be important. So you press second calculate. 2 will give you the option to calculate the zeros. Again, you want to get on the left side of a particular zero. Let's say we've got to calculate this one over here. Move your cursor so that you're next to it, not beyond any other zero to the left. Press Enter. And you want to move to the right side of that zero, just right of it. Press Enter again. And then press Enter a third time. And it calculates the very spot where that zero occurs. So this zero would be 3.935, etc. So those are two important things you can analyze. There are many more, but we'll get into that detail in another video. You can also check my TI-83 plus graphing features video, which goes over all of this on that calculator, basically the same um, configuration. Now let's say you wanted to graph a trig function, like sine of x, for example. And I will increase the amplitude so it shows up better on the normal window. 3 sine of x. Now, by the way, when you're graphing trig functions, it's better to be in radian mode. So you can go to that mode window at any time and make sure radian is selected. It wasn't um, due to my other video parts, um, so we need to select that. And then we'll go back to y equals. So I'm going to graph 3 sine x. Now, when you graph this in the normal window with the graph button, Hopefully you can tell, but the um, tick marks on the x-axis aren't really lining up very well, or the y-axis for that matter, um, with the function itself. In the y-axis you can kind of tell that it goes all the way up to 3 and down to negative 3, that's the amplitude of the function, but the tick marks on the x-axis really don't line up at all because they're just whole numbers. If you know and if you've worked with a sine graph or any of the trig function graphs, um, <clears throat> what uh, you need to pay attention to are um, multiples of half of pi, and uh, those aren't showing up here really well, but there's a special zoom feature for that, and it's called zoom trig. It's uh, the seventh option. If you click seven, look at the um, tick marks on the x-axis and the y-axis. Much different. They're much more spread out, and on the x-axis, every tick mark is pi over two. Um, separated from every other tick mark. So we've got 0 in the middle, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. So we see a whole period on each side of the y-axis for um, this sine graph. In addition, the uh, y-axis tick marks go from negative 4 to 4. So it's more, to, more useful for spreading out uh, the trig function so it sort of fills the frame, as we say. And um, that's just a special feature of uh, these calculators that let you graph trig functions much more easily. All right, guys, that's all I wanted to show you to give you sort of a quick introduction overview to this calculator. It's a fantastic calculator. Again, to turn it off, you press second and then on. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. 
give it a thumbs up, give it a comment. Let me know what else you want to see on this calculator in the next tutorial video. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. This is Falconator, signing out.